Our top story again from Pakistan. Two days after the country voted, we still don't have the final figures of winners and losers, but we can broadly give you the result. Former cricket star Imran Khan's pa party, the Pakistan Tehreek e Insaf, is now officially the winner of this historic election. Historic because it is for the first time in 70 years that Pakistan has seen three consecutive elections of a civilian government with no dictatorship in between. After two days of vote count, the Election Commission of Pakistan has announced that Khan's uh, PTI has won 114 of the 259 seats for which the votes have been counted. This is for the National Assembly, which in other words is the Pakistani parliament. Khan needed 137 to win a clear majority, so he's 23 short of that mark. He now must form a coalition government and there's no clarity on who these coalition allies will be. Nawaz Sharif's Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz, PMLN, has won 63 seats so far. He has rejected this result. He's accused the establishment of widespread fraud and manipulation. The Election Commission of Pakistan has rubbished these concerns. They say that no complaints have been received apart from requests for recounts. In the जो सिक्योरिटी फ्राम की गई फौज की तरफ से वो मिसाली रही उस सिक्योरिटी के दौरान जो फौज के जवानों का पोलिंग स्टेशन के अंदर रवैया था वो मिसाली रहा हमने कतन कोई उसकी शिकायत मसूद नहीं हुई और हम इसके लिए पाकिस्तान फौज के शुक्र गुजार हैं while the opponents and critics are questioning the credibility of this election, the winner is already looking at the next course of action. By his own admission, the biggest challenge for the Prime Minister of Pakistan will be to fix the country's economy. Shrinking foreign reserves, sinking tax collections and soaring trade deficit have sparked an economic crisis. It won't be an easy task for Imran Khan. He will need to take some urgent steps to prevent a potential collapse of Pakistan's economy. पाकिस्तान की तारीख में सबसे बड़ा आज पाकिस्तान इकोनॉमी का चैलेंज फेस कर रहा है हमारा कभी भी तारीख में इतना बड़ा फिजिकल डेफिसिट नहीं था हमारा कभी पाकिस्तान की तारीख में इतना ट्रेड डेफिसिट नहीं है कभी पाकिस्तान की तारीख में इतने कर्जे नहीं लिए हुए दीज वर्ड्स ऑफ इमरान खान डू नॉट डिस्क्राइब द मैग्नीट्यूड ऑफ द प्रॉब्लम अ क्राइसिस इज लूमिंग ओवर पाकिस्तान इकोनॉमी एक्सपोर्ट हैव श्रंक A spike in oil prices has increased trade deficit and Pakistan's foreign reserves are steadily dwindling. This has forced the country's central bank to devalue the Pakistani rupee four times since December last year. Pakistan's foreign reserves have dropped at the fastest pace in Asia. It is now at 9.1 billion dollars. That's barely enough to cover imports for two months. High imports have driven up Pakistan's current account deficit to 18 billion US dollars. Due to low tax compliance, Pakistan has one of the lowest tax to GDP ratios in Asia. The government of Pakistan gets a little over 12% of its GDP from tax collections. High debt is also adding pressure on Pakistan's economy. The country owes 92 billion dollars to its creditors. The elections have burnt an even bigger hole in Pakistan's pocket. A whopping 440 billion Pakistani rupees were reportedly spent on conducting the polls alone. Imran Khan does not have many options to fix Pakistan's economy. A bailout by the International Monetary Fund is on the cards. It won't be the first time though that Pakistan would seek a loan from the IMF. Since IMF's inception in 1980s, Pakistan has been given aid 12 times. This time around, Islamabad would need at least 10 to 15 billion dollars in aid to keep its economy afloat. But the aid package will come with strings attached. Typically, IMF hands out aid with tight conditions, often raising demands for key structural reforms to the economy. With the coalition government likely to take charge and the army's shadow looming over Pakistan's political scene, saving Pakistan's economy will not be an easy task. For Imran Khan. Your report beyond. With a hardliner like Mr. Khan taking the top office in Pakistan, the minorities there aren't very enthused. Less than 4% of Pakistan's population of 212 million is non-Muslim. Most of them are Hindus and this election is important for them too. Three Hindus have won the national and provincial polls, an awfully small number, yes.
but significant given the context. The PPP's Mahesh Kumar Malani has become the first Hindu candidate to win a National Assembly seat 16 years after non-Muslims got the right to vote and contest in the general election in this country. Malani contested and won the National Assembly seat in the southern Sindh province. He defeated 14 candidates and got 1,6630 votes. A Pakistani Hindu Rajasthani, Pushkarna Brahmin politician was a member of parliament from 2003 to 2008 on a reserved seat there, nominated by the PPP. Two other Hindus were elected to the Sindh Provincial Assembly, Gyan Chandisrani from Sanghar, which is a provincial seat, and Hari Ram Kishor Lal. He is uh, in another, another Hindu candidate who has won the Hyderabad provincial seat in Pakistan. Women and non-Muslims get two opportunities to become lawmakers. First by contesting elections on the 272 general seats from anywhere and after getting the nomination from a party having representation in the National Assembly. Non-Muslims were declared eligible to vote and contest this uh, election in Pakistan in 2002 under an amendment in the legal framework introduced by then president parvez musharraf they've also reserved seats in the senate national and provincial assemblies in pakistan the world has been watching this election very closely and its near unanimous verdict was this it wasn't fair the captain played a fixed match and he won barring blind allies like china who congratulated the iron brother pakistan for holding a successful election but then again china's understanding of democratic and fair elections is pretty limited so discount that our next report documents how imran khan has fared in the perception match elections in pakistan were closely watched around the world the result was not really a surprise with an impressive performance, Imran Khan managed to propel his party from the fringes to national prominence. Pakistan's allies are lining up to welcome him. But in Washington, there seems to be some skepticism. While the U.S. State Department said it is willing to work with the new government, it has also expressed concern over claims of rigging. A statement from the U.S. State Department said that Washington is concerned about freedom of expression being curtailed in the run-up to the elections. In his first address after the results, Imran Khan reached out to China. He said that Islamabad and Beijing should strengthen their relationship. China has not lost confidence of its all-weather friendship with Pakistan. China highly praises this and believes that all people in Pakistani society, including Imran, are resolute supporters of China-Pakistan friendship, which shows China and Pakistan have an all-weather friendship. No matter how the domestic situation changes, the China-Pakistan all-weather strategic cooperative partnership won't waver, which is in the common interests of both the countries and their people. While the results declared by Pakistan's election commission were still provisional, leading newspapers in the country declared Imran's victory, but also mentioned about the objections raised by other parties in the fray. Around the world, people could not ignore the influence Pakistan's army has on the electoral process. A cartoon in England's The Times newspaper showed Imran Khan batting on a cricket pitch with some help from an army general. Bureau Report, we are. Facebook has suffered a record loss of $120 billion in a single day. You heard that right, $120 billion. That's more than the GDP of some countries. It's the biggest single day loss for any company in the U.S. stock market history. In other words, the highest ever loss made by any company ever. After Facebook presented its second quarter report, its shares were down by more than 19%. It lost around $120 billion in its market value. It's the biggest one-day market cap loss by any company in the history of American markets. The market value of Facebook on Wednesday was at $630 billion. But after losing $119 billion, that figure came down to $510 billion by Thursday's close. If that's a lot of numbers for you, understand this. It's a huge loss to Facebook. They've burned a big hole in their pockets. After the biggest one-day slide, around $17 billion were lost from founder Mark Zuckerberg's net worth. Facebook earned the revenue of $13.23 billion through market analysts, uh, though market analysts rather had projected it to cross $13.36 billion. 
Wall Street had expected the tech giant to cross 1.49 billion global daily active users, but it could not manage to touch anything beyond 1.5. In fact, the figure is 1.47 billion users in this quarter. The internet firm has reported that daily active users' rates were up 11% year-on-year basis for this quarter, but this figure did not live up to the expectations of analysts. This rise somehow was supported by the user data of the Indo-Pacific region, led by India, Indonesia and other countries in this region, it looks like people in the Indo-Pacific region might still believe in Facebook's capacity to protect their data. They're still active users, but this is not the trend elsewhere in the world. Facebook's user base in Europe has been declining since the Cambridge Analytica scandal and the introduction of general data protection regulation in the European Union. The user base in Europe reported by the company is 279 million. Uh, point four. That's uh, 0.4 million less than what Wall Street had expected. Average revenue per user also was on the lower side. The company earned uh, $5.97 per user globally. Surprisingly, Facebook had lost the earnings from advertisement. It had a little over $13 billion of ad earnings. The markets had projected it at $13.16 billion. Now take a look at some of the biggest losses in a single day in the US stock markets and you'll get an idea of how big Facebook's loss has been. Facebook's chief financial officer, David Wenner, has said that the company will continue its focus on privacy and will make it better. Some media analysts believe that the company will bounce back in the next quarter. After Facebook, Twitter shares also took a beating at the stock exchange today, so it's been a bad week for social media giants. Twitter shares plunged by as much as 20% in early trading today after the company shared its second quarter results. According to Twitter, its monthly users dropped by 1 million in the second quarter. The company predicts that user growth will fall further in the coming months as it fights spam, fake accounts and malicious rhetoric on the platform. But there was a silver lining for Twitter this quarter. The company reported its third consecutive profitable quarter. It earned $100 million in the last three months. Around the same time last year, the company had reported a loss of $116 billion. So that's good news for Twitter. But Facebook and Twitter share similar woes. Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey has said that it's uh, his priority to reduce abusive conversations on the platform. He went on to say that his company's machine learning algorithms are identifying more than 9 million potential spam or automated accounts every week. So a lot of you must have seen your user account going down. They're, they're killing the bot accounts on Twitter and that's costing them a lot of money. Let's compare the $120 billion route in market cap of Facebook with the GDP of some countries. The United States has a GDP of $19,390 billion. The second largest economy in the world, China's GDP is $12,014 billion. Japan has an annual GDP of $4,872 billion and India's GDP is $2,611 billion. That's $2 trillion. Pakistan's GDP is $303 point nine nine three billion dollars while data shows that Bangladesh's GDP is two hundred and sixty one point three seven four billion dollars Kuwait stands at one hundred and twenty million dollars while the Ukraine's GDP is one hundred and nine point three two billion dollars Ecuador for Ecuador the number is one hundred and two point three one billion dollars while Sri Lanka is at $87.591 billion. And uh, next come figures from Oman, $66.5 billion. Botswana's annual GDP is barely $17 billion, while that of Afghanistan is $0.0262 billion. Zimbabwe stands at $0.0219 billion. Compare that to what Facebook has lost in one day's trading. It's not just the stock market that is giving Facebook the jitters. Its users seem to be moving away from the platform. The social media giant still remains the core business. The social media platform, rather, remains the core business of Facebook. The company is losing teenage users, which is one of the most important demographic for them. A study carried out by the Pew Research Center found that just 51% of teenagers between 13 and 17 in the U.S. use Facebook anymore. The number of users have, has dropped by 20% in the last two years alone. Teenagers are now turning to other platforms like YouTube, Instagram and Snapchat. 
In February this year, a similar study carried out by a market research company made similar claims. It claimed that Facebook's American user base in the 12 to 17 age category declined by nearly 10% in 2017. The study further claimed that Facebook will lose more than 2 million American users under the age of 25 this year. U.S. President Donald Trump's slogan, as we know, is to make America great again, and he's getting banners made with this slogan for campaigning for his second term. But turns out these flags were made in China and could get hit by the trade war that Trump himself started with Beijing. Keep America great. That's the slogan for Donald Trump's 2020 re-election campaign. While the next election in America is still a couple of years away, preparations are on in full swing. Banners and flags in red, white and blue are being printed in large numbers, not in America, but in China. This factory in China's Anhui province has bagged the contract from the Trump campaign. These flags come for cheap. They cost about one dollar a piece. Once they are out from the printer, a team of skilled workers on sewing machines give finishing touches to it. The Trump campaign has placed large orders for its promotional material. By engaging a factory in China, the Trump campaign saves a considerable amount of money. But Trump's own tariff war could hurt his supply of campaign material. The general manager of this factory in China says she may not be able to accept more orders in the future. Personally, this is my own feeling, but if Trump continues to demand tariff increases, as he has been doing, or he continues to agree with those who are against China, I definitely would not be able to accept more orders. That's because everyone can have a patriotic heart. So we won't let him improve his own economy, while us Chinese just shoot ourselves in the food. The Trump administration has slapped tariffs on $34 billion worth of goods from China. The American president has threatened to slap tariffs on more products. Such a move could affect all of China's exports to America, including his campaign flags. But Chinese workers are not losing their sleep over the trade war. What I'm making here now is a Trump banner. I know that he's the U.S. president. Every day we must produce over 1,000 of these. We've already made so many batches of them. I know that Trump's tariffs targeting China will have some effect, but we are not worried at all since we are producing foreign flags every single day. The U.S. president campaign's decision to engage a company in China presents a rather interesting paradox. Trump's re-election campaign had promised to only buy American. One can only assume that Trump will have a lot more questions to answer if he runs again for the presidency. Bureau Report, we on. Educating young minds should be about teaching youngsters how to think right. But in North Korea, it is about molding youngsters who are loyal to the regime above everything else. Here's a rare look, rather, into what goes on inside this top school in Pyongyang, the school which over generations has groomed some of the top officials and bureaucrats in the North Korean regime. It's a school like no other. No blackboards, no orthodox way of teaching. On the contrary, these classrooms are equipped with tanks, jet fighter simulators, and grenade launchers. This is a North Korean school. A real school where kids are put through a rigorous curriculum. The school was built to educate the bereaved children of the revolutionary martyrs who were sacrificed during the anti-Japanese armed struggle. Located in the heart, the Mangyongdai Revolutionary School was originally meant for the orphans of war with Japan. 